All right, people. Special delivery. By the way, the da Daily WTF has been my favorite. That I hope everybody knows Jay Diesel came from the Daily WTF, okay? This is going to be a good article. I just can feel it. Special delivery. Brad's phone rang with the telltale tone of an inner office call. Yeah? He briskly blurted out as he picked up the phone. What you need? That was actually his nice way of answering the phone. As the senior trader at Exacor, one of the world's largest energy trading companies, Brad didn't need to impress anyone, and in his mind, displaying anything less than a vicious hubris would be a sign of weakness. <laughs> Let's go, Brad. Let's go, Brad. Brad, vicious hubris. Let's go. Tom the genius. Uh, the res uh, receptionist nervously answered, There's a, a delivery for you, sir. They... <laughs> Brad scoffed. Cut her off. Just go sign for it, then. Is that really that hard to do? Can you do that? Can't you? Well, well sir, the receptionist winced. They're asking for more instructions, and we need to pay wharf edge charges. They said you'd know. I'm at a loss. Fine, Brad scowled. I guess I have to do everything around here. He slammed down the phone and marched out of his corner office. Despite Exethcor's location, the old docks district, their office was one of the most posh in the city. On the end of expensive, former warehouse sat the executive suites, which had a tremendous view of the city skyline. The other end, where Brad was headed towards, was the reception, which overlooked its own private bay on the river. <sighs> That's pretty posh. Okay, I'm here, he said angrily announced once he stepped foot into the lobby. So let's do this, what do I need to do? Brad stopped mid-sentence. His eyes were immediately drawn through the floor to ceiling windows and onto the river bay that Execor's building overlooked. There was an absolutely gigantic barge, nay, an armada of tightly connected barges overfilled with enormous piles of coal that was attempted to dock in front of the building. What the fu- You must be Brad, a cheerful, voice, a cheerful voice jumped in. Brad's eyes shifted toward the scruffy fellow wearing some sort of workman's uniform who was sitting in one of the reception chairs. Now, first and foremost, how in the Sam Hill are we supposed to moor this boat? I count two cleats, but we were- Sure as heck, uh, we can't hitch these. And shoot, do you even have a bulk berth? For once, Brad was speechless. He had absolutely no idea who that man was, and he could hardly understand a word he said. Plus, there was a gargantuan vessel that was slowly moving towards the building. Uh, he stuttered. Wait, are, are you delivering coal to us? Well, yeah, 28,000 tons of good old black gold, the workman sarcastically furrowed his brow, adding. I mean, we did get the right address, har har. This is Execor, and this is Pier 53, and are you Brad, the fellow who ordered it, right? It was that moment that Brad's palm almost immediately made contact with his forehead. He realized that something must have gone awry. Instead of virtually trading 28 tons of coal, Brad had somehow ended up with 28 tons of real coal. Brad flew too close to the sun. Too close to the sun. He flew too close to the black gold. How much is 28 tons of coal? I don't know. I have never bought coal. To tell you the honest truth, I don't even know how to buy one ton of coal, let alone 28 of them. Okay? 28,000 tons. Two, 28 million pounds of coal. If you've ever watched Trading Places, the 1983 classic starring Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. By the way, Trading Places is one of my favorite videos of all time. It's it, Eddie Murphy does such a good job, and so does Dan Aykroyd. Uh, then you're probably at least familiar with commodities market. At a basic level, commodities such as gold, wool, and soybeans are sold by producers and eventually delivered to buyers. But Billy Ray Valentine didn't strike it rich and bankrupt the Duke brothers by hauling around frozen concentrated orange juice. He actually did an insider deal trading and bamboozled the Duke brothers. Instead, they worked the commodities market by buying and selling FCOJ future contracts. Actually, that's really the only way to trade in commodities. Okay, that means you're trading the futures. Effectively, what is the future price of these things? Will we be able to produce a lot of it or a little of it? If you produce little of it and there's high demand, then the value of it goes way up. So if you bought future contracts, then you're going to do really well. If you bought not the right kind, you're going to do really bad. Uh, 28 tons cost 4 million. Dang, okay, that's a lot. A futures contract is pretty straightforward. You agree to buy X units of commodity at N dollars per unit at some fixed future date. While it might seem a bit strange for an individual to agree to buy 20 tons of pork bellies in April for $34,420, even if he really loves bacon, the idea is to sell the to-be-delivered pork bellies long before April and sell them for more than 34000 Just about every conceivable commodity is bought and sold in this manner long before the commodity is even produced. The whole 
whole point of all this trading is to shift the risk and rewards of fluctuating commodity prices from producers, farmers, and miners to the traders. I don't know how that shifts the risks and rewards. It doesn't make any sense to me, but this does happen. This is real, okay? We legitimately trade the future price of frozen orange juice concentrate. It's basically just gambling. Is it? I don't even know. Y'all pay attention to this. This uh, commerce happens uh, on the CBOE, the Chicago Board of Exchange, and it's much larger than the stock market. I've heard about this. That it's. I have never done anything with it, but I hear people make a lot of money in here, and it sounds crazy. I don't. E I don't even have any reason to understand how this stuff works. Of course, because commodity traders don't actually want to be stuck with tons and tons of pork bellies. The whole series of middlemen from the broker to the exchanges to the clearinghouses work hard to ensure that when you say I will buy 300 tons of pork bellies for four or 518,000 in May you don't actually buy 300 tons of pork bellies for 518,000 in May brokers for example will set up round turn trades so that for each future contract purchase an offsetting contract can be sold to whoever actually wants to buy the goods the exchanges automate trading systems have all sorts of rule engines to make sure that obvious errors like delivering truckloads of commodities to a commercial office park don't slip through and finally, processors at the clearinghouse will double-check transactions to make sure they weren't sent over in error. All that said, it's almost impossible for traders to actually buy commodities that they're buying. Well, almost impossible. And that, my friends, is where this story begins. The perfect storm. At Execure, trading coal on only one exchange, the WTF... <laughs> <laughs> stock exchange. The WTF stock exchange. I like this stock exchange. And they didn't trade coal very often. As such, when the WTF stock exchange upgraded its public-facing web service-based API, Execor's internal trading system could no longer communicate with it. With a couple pending coal trades, this presented a bit of a problem. Oh my goodness, this is so good. Fortunately, Execor had staff of crack programmers that were able to hack together a solution that worked with the WTF SE's new API. Essentially, the coder added a bit of XML to their trading requests, including the following snippet. Additional properties, physical address, value false. Notice anything off about that XML? If you said value should be zero instead of false, then you give yourself a pat on the back. As it turns out, WTFSE only recognized ones and zeros to represent true and false. And if the value was neither one nor zero, it would simply default to one. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Now, this normally wouldn't have uh, been that big of a deal. To ensure accurate transactions, the WTF, SE, and just about all other exchanges send back a trade confirmation with all the original information encoded in their XML. That way, both parties have to understand each other's data. On Execor's end, everything looked hunky-dory, especially as the result of the following line. Bool, physical delivery, get node value, physical delivery, two lower equals true. Kudos to the developer for verifying the correct case. Yes, that's true. The two lower. Well done, because some people capital T that true. I'm looking at you, Python, okay? You keep struggling with for loops and capital T and F node values. What the hell? Why, why would you do that? Why is true capital T? I hate you. Why is it a string true? Because we're talking about XML, dog. But a string can be infinitely more strings than simply true or false, such as one or zero. Whoops. Oof. The problem is becoming so apparent. This is why something like protobufs or some required typed format just feels so good. When you're playing with third-party services, you're getting fandangled by ones and trues. Oof. Oof. You know what I mean? Even a mistakenly confirmed incorrect trade shouldn't have been that big of a deal, since the clearinghouse would notice some pretty big problems with the trade. You can't just call up FedEx and request a delivery of thousands upon thousands of tons of raw material to some office complex downtown. Commodities can only be delivered to a fixed number of delivery points, such as warehouses adjacent to train yards or ports. Oh no, it's because it's a posh building in what used to be a delivery area. Of course, since Execor's offices were located on Pier 53, a recent Recently redeveloped warehouse district off the river, it would have seemed like a logical place to accept a delivery of a whole ass bunch of coal, especially to rules engines. Oops. <laughs> Yes. Fortunately, the commodity futures trading market doesn't rely entirely on software. There are back office personnel on both sides of the transaction and several places in the middle to make sure that trader doesn't do something silly, like accidentally click the physical delivery checkbox, enter into round turn trades that create an instant net loss, and so on. So with everyone looking over transactions, you think someone along the way would have noticed that trading giant Execors asked for a physical delivery of million and a half dollars worth of coal. Actually, someone probably did. 
But because the trade came from Brad, there was just no way it could have been made in error. Is physical delivery really just a checkbox? It must be. It's a true or false. That sounds like a checkbox to me. This is so good. The best part about this is the fact that Brad was such an asshole that people didn't want to correct Brad because he is so correct. Oh man, this is so good. As the senior trader at uh, Execor, Brad made it very clear that no one, not even his holiness the Pope, shall question his trades. After all, Brad makes complex trading decisions that no one else could possibly comprehend. Sometimes he buys high and sells low. Sometimes he holds in a decline. Sometimes he refuses to sell at any price. Brad works in mysterious ways. And if he said do it, then it better get done. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Man, just imagine being Brad that you do all of these things just to feel like you're a champion. And then what happens? You get wrecked. Brad's greater than Rick. Brad is single-handedly greater than Rick. Early Christmas present. Now don't go telling me that this coal ain't yours, the workman said defensively, sensing something was awry. I mean, if you don't want it, that's your business, but this here is your coal, Mr. Brad. As much as Brad wanted to deny it, he knew it was his. And not only that, but he had haughtily confirmed, reconfirmed, and reconfirmed with XR's own back office processing team. He had just assumed, like he always did, that he, uh, the mouth-breathing paper pushers couldn't read English. <laughs> Mouth breathers. <laughs> As he played back the last thing he told one of the preprocessors about the coal order. What part of my execute my fucking trade don't you understand? He wondered what he could possibly do with 56 million pounds of real coal. I've never been put in that situation. Try to imagine for a moment how you would unload a mountain of coal worth a million and a half dollar. Craigslist has its limits after all. As it turned out, it was more difficult than Brad could ever imagined to sell real coal. The commodities market really only deals in futures and everyone who actually needs 28 tons of coal has bought it long in advance. And besides, who wants to buy coal from some guy named Brad? <laughs> <laughs> There's Brad again selling coal. Who wants to buy coal from Brad? Eventually, after paying exorbitant wharfing, shipping, environmental, docking, unloading, loading, and multiple fee fees, Brad was finally able to unload it for 20 cents on the dollar. Ever since the big purchase, Brad has never been able to live down his mountain of coal. Every time he passed others in the hallway, he knew that they knew about the coal. And they knew that he knew that they knew. No one really poked fun or laughed at him, but it didn't matter. Brad was no longer thought of as the senior trader at Exacor. Instead, he was the guy who accidentally bought all the coal. One time I accidentally broke a production feature on a very specific, very exciting release of some content on Netflix. Sure, it only broke for like four people, but I still broke it for those four people. There was a while there, I was known as the guy who broke it for the people waiting for the feature. And the people that were waiting for the feature was like my boss and a couple other people. It was only people who were waiting for it to happen live. It broke, it was a countdown billboard. It was a, the countdown billboard on Netflix, okay? The countdown. It counted down to zero, and then I accidentally created an infinite loop. They say four loops are easy, you know? That's what they say. Three, two, one, infinity, okay? Sometimes you actually put an infinity out there, you know? Sometimes when you walk in, you go to the penthouse. And sometimes when you walk in, you go to the outhouse. Just happened to meet my day for an outhouse filled with skill issues and regret and an email that I would eventually say, send that would say, I am sorry, I screwed that one up. <laughs> sometimes you forget not to use signed integers. Sometimes you forget zero and division causes things that are very large numbers. The spec wasn't clear enough. It just clearly wasn't clear enough. Sometimes you index you with a float. Yeah, it's true. That's the worst you did. Oh no, I did worse. I've done a lot of stupid things at Netflix, but that's just the one that reminds me of the, the most flack I've received. I one time had my boss tell me that I had to step away from the keyboard when I'm feeling upset. That was like seven years ago, eight years ago. I learned a good lesson that day. Don't send emails when you're upset, okay? Don't send emails when you're upset. You're gonna say things that you're not happy about. Why did you make the autoplay feature? Okay, I'm gonna go over this one last time. I made the autoplay feature for Netflix. When you go to netflix.com, you get hit with a trailer and it plays with the volume on. Now, during the process, there were nine cells, okay? Nine 
AB cells, nine AB cells, nine separate experiences. Number eight, I fought for, okay? I fought for number eight. You know what number eight did? Number eight muted the trailer and did localized subtitles for you to be able to read the trailer. It muted it for you because I, like you said, hmm, I don't think people would want volume on. Well, guess what, jackass? Y'all loved the volume on. You guys couldn't stop playing the show when volume was on. And guess what? It's not my fault that you did that. I opened the door. I made the door. I drew the door and said, here you go. Walk through the door. And you guys said, nah, I'm going to take that other door, the one with the volume on, because you know what? When you actually play the when you play the trailer, and then there's actually that funny part, I actually kind of like it. Yeah, I'm going to go with that one. That's the one I want to go with, because really deep down inside of me, I actually am the loser that likes the volume on, but I'm going to complain about it. And then I'm going to see a show that I like and that I'm actually going to watch it. And then it's going to be great. But I'm going to complain about it on Twitter because I am a keyboard warrior. Get the hell out of the way. The name is this video is going to be very difficult to edit. There was a lot of stuff that happened during this. A Jen.